Welcome back to the PFC podcast. The views and opinions you are about to hear are the speakers and do not necessarily reflect those of anyone else. Now on to the podcast. Welcome back to the PFC podcast. This is Dennis and today I am with Stacy and Andrew. How are you doing? Good morning. I'm doing well. And today we are going to talk about surgery for non-surgeons. So this is a very hot topic at the moment. Um, but uh, without further ado, if uh, Stacy, would you mind doing a real quick introduction? Um, I think if anybody doesn't know you, they should climb out of the rock that they've been hiding under. <laughs> uh, this is Stacy Shackelford. I am currently the chief of the joint trauma system. Uh, a trauma surgeon and deployed a handful of times to U.S. Central Command. Very good. Uh, Andy? Hey, I'm Andy Fisher. I'm currently a general surgery resident at the University of New Mexico, still in the military. I'm previously a PA in the Army Special Operations Command. Very good. So obviously we have two very experienced providers in both uh, – you know, clinical medicine, obviously very austere military type medicine. So, uh, Jamie, Jamie Reesberg, you know, he said it very well. If you need a surgeon to support the mission, you should probably bring a surgeon. Um, you know, with the amount of countries that SOF is deployed through throughout the world, why can we not just bring more surgeons? Stacy. <laughs> Uh, so as uh, that's a wicked question because uh, there's no easy answer to any of this. Um, but it, I guess it gets down to what you mean by need a surgeon. And, you know, it starts with your mission analysis and uh, the risk that you're incurring and uh, the challenges of getting a surgical team to where, you know, where they're needed. Um, there are a couple of, uh, ground truths that we've been looking at with data and I've ca been calling that the, uh, timeline of effective interventions. And we know, uh, from the data from the trauma registry that, uh, I mean, it sounds obvious, but life-saving interventions delivered too late do not improve survival. So if you, for instance, are bleeding to death and getting a blood transfusion too late, it's no longer going to help you. Uh, that time is about 30 minutes after injury for those who are bleeding to death from survivable injuries. Uh, for surgical teams, it's about an hour uh, to really have a, an effect on survival. We uh, know that you need to get to a surgical team in about an hour. Um, people have tried to extend that, and you can actually ex extend it a little bit with blood transfusions, uh, but for the most part, uh, we're really talking about an hour to get to a surgical team. So that's the question, you know, for the operation is, is there a high enough risk of, you know, life-threatening injury that you um, think that it's worth the expense, challenge, uh, et cetera, to get a surgical team within an hour? Um, we know it takes a lot to move a surgical team, uh, to establish the surgical team, to uh, sustain a surgical team in terms of just weight and cube, um, you know, uh, uh, security, supplies, et cetera. And so there, there's, there, you know, it's a bunch of uh, uh, competing challenges. Uh, in addition, you know, just... Um, that's kind of separate from the issue of having enough surgeons in the DOD uh, to be able to, you know, support every place where we would theoretically like to have a surgeon. And then there's also the issue of, of skill sustainment is just having surgeons and surgical teams sitting around doing nothing. Uh, then they start becoming less effective at their primary mission. Andy, from your perspective and your, you know, prior experience, you know, Again, why can't we just stuff it full of surgeons, right? Somebody might get hurt. Why can't we just have more surgeons on the battlefield? Uh, I think in my you know, anecdotal experience, the number of people that require a surgical intervention during any operation is overall relatively small. 
Now, this is based upon, you know, the past 20 years of conflict doing uh, mostly unconventional warfare. You know, in a true, I think, peer-to-peer conflict, uh, we face something different. And even at that point, we're still looking at, no, you can't bring a surgeon everywhere because the number of casualties uh, that would require surgical intervention uh, were are, pro- are going to be, one, much greater. Uh, so we're going to have to teach people how to properly triage in order to then evacuate people probably more or, or closer to a more centralized location. Uh, so, I, I, you know, I think like Stacy had mentioned, you know, there's, there's a lot of different uh, variables that go into this. Uh, I think from an unconventional standpoint, very few people probably actually need surgical intervention. To, does a, as she said, there's a lot of stuff that kind of comes along with the surgeon. You know, can, can you know, uh, you know, some of the, the legendary case that, uh, you know, Dave King did in the, in the back of a 47, how often does that happen? Amazing case. And something that uh, obviously has been described in the literature and been published, uh, but it's just so rare. Uh, most of those people, by the time they get to a surgeon, are either dead or, you know, are, are relatively stable and don't necessarily maybe not need surgical intervention at that time. Uh, and, and then again, if we go back to a more of a peer to peer sort of conflict, we're looking at people, uh, you know, putting, uh, you know, battalion surgeons, PAs and combat medics in that forward setting to be able to properly triage and assess who actually needs to be, uh, you know, evacuated to the surgeon and then get that uh, surgical intervention as needed. Uh, we'll see a lot, I think, a lot of uh, initially in those sort of settings, a lot of over triaging and an overwhelming number of people going, trying to get to some sort of surgical, uh, you know, facility or some place where a surgeon is located and them being trying to say, whoa, 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 there's way too many people here. So we got to kind of rethink how we kind of approach how we're going to uh, triage and send people to the rear. Yeah, I think that's a super good point because not everybody that has a break to the skin needs a surgeon, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I can I can honestly think of a, of a specific case uh, in Afghanistan where a guy got – uh, we were ambushed, and a guy got shot in the abdomen, uh, in the right lower quadrant, uh, and it was he had also had exit point at at the right flank, posterior flank. You know, based upon our capabilities at that point, it's like, well, get this guy on a helicopter, get him to a surgeon now. Uh, you know, he was completely stable the entire time as I treated him. Uh, now, what happened? It ended up for the most part, uh, it was uh, uh, a non. It did not penetrate the abdominal cavity. And so, you know, we have to be able to be a little bit smarter in a, I think, in a peer-to-peer conflict in order to kind of assess those situations or in a more austere environment outside of, hey, I have a, a helicopter that's 10 minutes away in order to evacuate this casualty. And I think technology will apply to these situations too. So if I can, you know, as these the PAs, docs, medics in these forward environments who have those capabilities as technology improves may be able to determine that. Right. Um, so I guess a follow up question with you, Stacy, um, since you're on the receiving end of all these injuries, how frequently were you uh, receiving a patient that didn't actually need surgery? Oh, frequently. Yeah. In uh, CENTCOM, uh, for sure. Because I, you know, I think we had so many resources available that we always used, you know, in general, used an abundance of caution to get people, you know, a complete evaluation to make sure that, you know, they got the best treatment possible. And, you know, I think we will always do that. We'll always do the best with the resources that we had. Just happened that we had a lot of resources in, right. in uh, CENTCOM, but um You know, if you think about other uh, places where the actual resources to evacuate someone could involve like all the way from Africa to Germany or something like that, where the the massive amount of resources to evacuate that person plus losing them to the mission. So, I mean, again, with all these decisions, you know, and and I, you know, obviously the reason that you picked this topic is because there's a lot of controversy and a lot of, uh, a lot of unknowns, but you're really constantly, constantly weighing, you know, the 
the cost of of um, the different options. It's just, I mean, it's just a constant decision making process of risk versus really reward, right? You know, ideally, I want a trauma, a full trauma team to be on somebody's hip pocket, out of danger, but immediately available. Um, but that's that's not really reality, you know. So that's why you you bring medics, right? Right. I, I tell you what. So I th- I think it's I think it's funny how we we assume that you know we got to have that surgeon there all the time versus a little bit better at overall triaging uh, at the point of injury. I remember, uh, you know, again, it's, it's anecdotal, but this comes from a planning standpoint. Uh, you know, when I was uh, the, uh, you know, deputy surgeon in, uh, in charge of the task force in Afghanistan in 2016, and we had an ODA that wanted to move a surgical team so far forward that they could just use a four-wheeler to drive back and forth from the point of injury uh, to drop off casualties. And I'm serious. And I, I believe, even though I just said this is absolutely ridiculous, I think they, they went ahead with that plan. Uh, and I was like, we have, to, we have to get out of this idea that you have to have a surgeon in your hip pocket. While surgery is critically important for those who need it, again, the, the number of people that actually need the immediate surgical intervention in 60 minutes is, is – I think overall relatively low from what we've seen. Now, what we what we may see in a peer to peer conflict may be different, but again, we will have so many overwhelming casualties in those situations. You know, look, you look back to any war that we've done, World War Two, World War One, uh, that these you're going to have to learn how to triage appropriately. You know, and I mean, it kind of also gets to the point of like not all surgical teams are created equal, and you know, what size surgical team is needed for any particular operation um like jts so you mean started... army versus air force <laughs> yes <laughs> absolutely air force is the best for sure go blue uh but uh you know when you think about this it really comes down to the size of the team um and you know i think our smallest surgical teams are single surgeon teams with the appropriate amount of support uh averaging about five man surgical teams and then, you know, two surgeon teams, four surgeon teams, all the way up to roll threes. And, you know, I think the critical threshold comes between one and two surgeon teams. We've started trying to look at the difference between those two teams in terms of capabilities to, to you know, to um, save lives. We know there are some cases that are really beyond the capabilities of a single surgeon team. However, they can also insert uh, typically closer to the point of injury. And, uh, you know, if you think about a limited number of resources, surgeons on the, you know, in a certain theater, would you rather have them clumped together in larger teams or kind of sprinkled out into single surgeon teams? Um, and uh, it's an extremely complex analysis because uh, the closer you are to the point of injury as a surgical team, the more likely you are to see patients that are uh, um, at higher risk of dying. Uh, Your highest risk of death is in the minutes after injury, and uh, it continues a very, very steep uh, risk of death during the first hour. And so really every single minute matters during that first hour. So if you're a single surgeon team and you see a patient quicker, uh, more of your casualties will actually die just because they're at higher risk of death. And so trying to compare one and two surgeon teams is, is, um, is extremely challenging uh, to be able to account for that time and the deaths that occur en route to your team. But um, in general, we haven't seen a huge difference between single surgeon teams and two surgeon teams. And I think it gets down to what Andy said about there's just not that many patients that truly, truly – uh, are in need of the extra capabilities of a surgical team, and especially a two surgeon team versus a one surgeon team. It's just a small number of patients, right? Um, I think I, I think ultimately this comes down to something that is just making us feel better, right? 
You know, when you're a kid, a you feel thing. better when you have your blanket. Taken? <laughs> I said that's not a small thing. We've actually talked about that in terms of, you know, how does medical support increase the lethality of the force? And, you know, I know we've invested a lot in lethality, um, but just the confidence that you get uh, to assume risk on a mission uh, actually increases the lethality of the force. And, you know, we've certainly seen on the extreme side, we've seen, you know, with our partner forces really just refusing, you know, to take risk on the battlefield when, you know, there's no medical support versus when they have access to U.S. medical support and they're much more willing to assume risk. Um, I think it would be, you know, not quite as extreme uh, with our, you know, highly trained U.S. forces, but still, I think it's a huge factor in their uh, lethality. Yeah, you're. I think you're absolutely right. That's why there's medics there. Sure. Um, you know, like the 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 fighter on the ground should be have that level of confidence in the medic that's standing next to him. Um, but I think, uh, it's almost like, uh, I don't know, just knowing there's a actual doctor somewhere behind you and it just gives you this level of confidence, you know, I mean, um, you know, but you were mentioning single versus double surgeon teams, I guess, what capabilities would a single surgeon team bring that, you know, say, you know, an 18 Delta or an SOIDC, you know, couldn't provide? Um, well, it's more of the team approach than, you know, of uh, the surgeon specifically. But to be able to address torso hemorrhage is really why they're there. Um, they are highly dependent on evacuation capabilities as well. So they don't typically have a lot of resources at that location. But, you know, in terms of we have actually looked at what is the minimum uh, team that you can actually call a surgical team versus a resuscitation team. And um, we have had a consensus with our interoperability standards work group that a surgical team requires a minimum of one surgeon, one anesthesiologist, um, a uh, nurse, and at least a total of five people total to uh, be able to call that a surgical capability. Uh, in addition, they need a minimum of 10 units of blood. Um, and that will allow, you know, uh, to uh, sedate the patient, put them under anesthesia, resuscitate the patient, and address the horse, the torso hemorrhage. Um, and again, that is like literally the bare minimum that you need to be able to uh, do that for a moderately critical patient, you know, so that uh, that's, there's still going to be casualties that are beyond that capability as well. Oh, absolutely. I think it's important that that's one casualty. Right. Correct. Yeah. Right. That's mm -hmm. that's not like, hey, I have three surgical patients and I got a surgery team. That's the, they can take care of one casualty at patient. one at a that time. A You're surgery. right. Yeah. And and that's that's a significantly limiting factor. Uh, that I, I I'll be honest with you. So you know, it, it's we kind of we had talked briefly, be, you know, before we started recording that. You know, my appreciation of what uh, what I've learned in the past, you know, two years as a surgery resident and uh, being in, as I said, a austere level one trauma center here in, in New Mexico in Albuquerque, uh, it, you know, you're often you're at the point to where it's like we can only literally we can only do so much. I can't take someone to surgery if I do not have X, you know, available. And uh, we are. And that is, I think, compounded uh, exponentially in a combat setting. Uh, so I certainly have learned that uh, you, you just can't, hey, I got a surgeon with me so we can go do this. Or, hey, you know, I'm a PA. I can do this. A, a PA, combat medic, doctor that is a non-surgeon physician can do procedures, can do some procedures, but they can't. They, they're not unable to really, I think, take someone to the – they can't take anyone to the operating room 
and can probably and unlikely to ever be able to control that non-compressible trosser hemorrhage. It's a uh, uh, significantly challenging to open up a belly or a chest and try to uh, control that hemorrhage, and they survive with any sort of, you know, normal life. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I it's it's a. Uh, it's incredibly humbling, I think, to be going through this uh, from what I've been through and then and recognize that, you know, it's uh, uh, what the what the training entails and what is required to be able to do this is far more than I I, I would say far more, but certainly more than I had than I had appreciated earlier in my career. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I think we can all recognize that there's going to be a need for surgical capability looking forward into the future, right? Um, And we also recognize there isn't enough surgeons, qualified surgeons that are capable of, uh, you know, doing these tough procedures, enough support for those those surgeons doing those tough procedures uh, to go everywhere, right? So everybody feels comfortable about this. Um, But we have medics everywhere. There's a bunch of non-surgical providers everywhere. Um, why can't we just um, give them all the surgical capability, you know, all the training, all the supplies, all the stuff? Why can't we just put the load on them? My program is five years for a reason. It literally takes a minimum of five years how to teach someone how to uh, how to operate. Uh, it, actually, doing most of the procedures is pretty, pretty easy. And as, actually, I think it was Stacy who had send, said to me one time that she could teach anyone to operate in a year. It's determining who do you take the operating room. So who is the person that you're going to choose out of all these people, all your casualties, that's the one person that you're going to take. And that is the most cha- the most challenging aspect of this. And then once, well, if you take them to the operating room and then you're able to actually save them, how are you going to maintain them in the post-operative setting? That is critical. So now you have someone in ICU, most likely in ICU status. And ICU care is just, you know, it's not just put them on, give them some blood and put them on a vent and just walk away. Uh, Again, there, there are a lot of, uh, nuances and challenges to providing care in both the preoperative and postoperative setting uh, that aren't necessarily appreciated. Uh, but if you strictly talk about going to the operating room, um, once you open up that abdomen, you are uh, you open that abdomen and you see a pool of blood. Are you going to be able to teach someone in a you know short course? How to properly pack, identify, control hemorrhage, and do everything else, everything else that you have to do in order for them to be able to make it out of there. And who's going to do the anesthesia for you? And yeah, who's going to be who's going to be a scrub? Who's going to be your nurse there that's going to be able to take care of everything that you need every time you're like, I need X. Are they going to be able to get it for you? I mean, the, the it's it's just a uh, an overwhelming. Uh, a situation that I don't think that we could ever say, hey, okay, I got non-compressible torso hemorrhage. I can teach someone how to control this in a free hospital environment outside of temporizing agents that we've, uh, you know, have talked about along PFC and uh, in T4C. It's Casey? a wicked problem set, you know, because they always present it to me <laughs> as uh you know, all right, I'm faced with a uh, casualty in front of me that's bleeding to death. You know, I can't make him any worse. He's bleeding to death. Uh, should I just let him die or should I try something? And, uh, you know, as I've thought through this problem set, uh, I literally don't know if opening their abdomen is going to make them better or worse compared to compared to the option of simply transfusing as much blood as you can and not opening the abdomen. Uh, we have, you know, uh, 
working with the folks at the uh, schoolhouse, talking through how to uh, how we might approach this as a medic. And we have certainly recommended that is there is a minimum, minimum n- amount of resources that you would need to even begin to consider whether you should open the abdomen. And uh, for starting with, this is not a single medic uh, procedure in any way, shape or form. If you only have one medic and you have to choose, you know, you can do one thing at a time, essentially give blood, <laughs> stop external bleeding and give blood, period. There's no question there. Um, yeah. Because if you have to stop giving blood over the abdomen, you've already made them worse. So uh, so the minimum you would need to even begin to think about this would be somewhat of the equivalent of a surgical team. You know, you need someone to manage the sedation and the medications, keep the patient asleep. Uh, number two, you need, you know, and the airway, make sure they're breathing. Uh, and number two, you need someone to uh, give blood. Like that's a full-time uh, job right there. And then, you know, one person to actually do the surgery, but they need, they will need an assistant as well. And so um, minimum of 10 units of blood, like I said, for our surgical team. And so this is basically setting up, you know, a uh, equivalent of a surgical team, but staffing it with less trained individuals. And, you know, and this is where it comes in, like, all right, I get that this patient's, um, doesn't have any other options at this point. You're either going to watch him bleed to death or try to do surgery. But ultimately the question that we don't know the answer to is uh, would you be better off just giving blood, just focusing on resuscitating him, trying to evacuate him and uh, potentially looking at some other adjuncts to controlling hemorrhage. Like we've looked at Reboa's, or even the abdominal aortic junctional tourniquets, um, other ways to think about, you know, trying to address this torso hemorrhage rather than doing an open laparotomy. Um, and then, like Andy yeah. said, you know, you do laparotomy, and then what are you going to do? Just packing, you know, packing laps into the four corners of the abdomen? That's probably not going to really stop bleeding. Yeah, I mean, everybody wants to do something, right? Um, I think that's a pretty human answer. We'll do something and something is better than nothing. Um, but we also like, you know, like we talked about before is just triaging, right? Can I, if I do something, is this likely to make things better or am I just prolonging the inevitable? Um, cause palliative care is a, is a thing as well. So I, if you don't mind chiming, I think uh, one, I, I do believe that temporizing agents like Reboa uh, or Groa uh, and other things that uh, that are out there, foam even, I think those are viable options for, again, temporary temporizing agents in order to get them to a surg- surgeon, uh, but obviously not definitive. And those in itself require uh, a lot of training. So when you talk about, you know, previously we talked about, hey, why can't we just teach people to do surgery? Well, we can teach people, I think, how to do these temporizing measures. And I think that's important to do, uh, even though, you know, there are people out there who don't necessarily agree with what I say. You know, I've been trying I've been on my soapbox for about seven years doing it. Uh, you know, the, I think there's a place for it. Uh, we, I think we still have yet to maybe determine the, the right patient. Uh, to do it and and the right uh, person. I, I 100% agree with Stacy that a single medic is not the answer. That is a team approach, and that is critical, that you just can't do this by yourself. Uh, but I think, I, and again, and as I move on, I, sorry, and as I move on, I want to say that I think the idea is that we need to recognize who is likely to die in the first 24 hours. Uh, and, you know, I could say that you know, hey, we just published a paper about this, which we did, uh, that kind of demonstrated, you know, who dies in this first 24 hours and how to necessarily, what's the best way to, I guess, uh, recognize them and identify them early. Uh, and, and I think, uh, you know, we, as we kind of move forward, we kind of need to do that. Like, who is going to die in 24 hours? And then we'll maybe triage from there. 
You know, we've looked at that a little bit differently, Andy, and uh, you just made me think about um, how to triage really large-scale casualty events and how to identify. What you're really trying to do is identify those patients who are so resource-intensive that treating them will, you know, cause other people to die, take away your resources. And the way we um, thought about it is that time frame between zero and one hour If you cannot live one hour without a ventilator and blood transfusion, this identifies you as a very critical patient. Uh, Yes, uh, many of these people can be saved, but it is a huge investment in resources in terms of all of the critical care resources and resuscitation resources that will be needed. And so potentially, if you're faced with just a large number of casualties, uh, if you do every intervention short of ventilator support and blood transfusion in the first hour. So everything to clear the airway, everything to decompress the chest, everything to stop external hemorrhage. But after one hour is the only time that you consider providing ventilator and blood transfusion support. Uh, That will actually um, identify the patients who have more survivable injuries just by having survived an hour. And that is another way we've looked at uh, trying to handle such large-scale triage situations. I, I don't disagree with that. I would like to see or like to hear you comment on the difference between blood transfusion versus ventilator. Because a blood transfusion is pretty easy to do. And, and uh, you know, a lot of situations, it's, you have a lot of people available to, to be able to give a unit of blood. A vent... That's totally different. Yeah, yeah. So, so what's the difference between the two? Uh, so the difference is there's – well, clearly there's a difference. But uh, in terms of survivability, right. what you're trying to I do is identify those patients who have uh, less resource-intensive, more survivable injuries. And so, and so it truly right. depends on the scale of the event. Um, and actually, uh, I think it is important to identify whether you're talking about, we actually use the term ultra mass cow. So the difference between a mass cow and an ultra mass cow, uh, in the mass cow, your goal is different. Your goal is to identify the 10% of patients, you know, average of 10% of the patients with life-threatening injuries and actually provide optimal treatment to all 10% of them, right? Uh, spite through your triage actions. Whereas in an ultra mass cow, uh, now your resources are actually truly overwhelmed and you literally cannot get the resources to everybody that has survivable injuries. And uh, that's, you know, that is a judgment call uh, at that point. Uh, And also the size of the event may actually decide this for you. So for example, if you're not able to approach the casualties within the first hour, based on whatever the event was or the challenges that you're facing, uh, those patients that are massively bleeding to death have probably already died. And I, so I think it, in real in reality, uh, the ultra mass cow situation will kind of make that call for you. Many times. I, I, get, I can see that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I can. I can but I do think is, that unfortunately, people happens. on scene are really the critical yeah. actors at that point, you know, and so it kind of comes into what can we teach our non-medical and medical first responders to do quickly in a large scale event. And I think, all you know, in terms of doing the greatest good for the greatest people, which is the purpose of triage, we really are focused on stopping external hemorrhage as our, you know, our number one goal, clearing the airway really just by preventing suffocation. Sometimes that's extrication, getting them out from under a crushing object, et cetera. Crazy how much uh, the basics come uh, to be really important. Yes. Yes. Oh, I know, and that's you know when you Basic talk about this surgical, probably saves more lives than <laughs> you anything. You talk about medics right? doing surgery. Exactly, we're all on the same page. You know, uh, how can you do the greatest good for the greatest number? Uh, it comes down to um, you know stopping external bleeding, clearing clearing the airway, uh, medical and non medical first responders. Yeah, um, but everybody wants to learn more, um, more 
more capability, more uh, larger scope of practice equals uh, more cool points. So, um, <laughs> you know, do we do we need to really expand? I guess the scope, or maybe we just double down on the basics. Can we do both? I um, I, I don't mind ex expanding scopes. Uh, of you know scope of care and capabilities as long as we have uh, one uh, proper initial training. But I think more importantly, which I think you know the military fails in many places, is uh, proper sustainment training. Uh, much of that I think is due to our inability to have you know actual patients in front of us for months, years at a time. Uh, that in those similar situations, and we are just too large of a uh, of an organization, or to say, hey, we can put every medic inside of an ER, and so they can get you know this exposure and be able to see this, and then also be able to do it behind you know the attending, the resident, the medical student, da 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 da, -da on down the line. So uh, I think that's where it's important. I don't mind seeing the expansion of some scope. Uh, and capabilities, but I'd like to see it uh, an actual plan that works in place. Uh, but more importantly, ensuring that every person in the military can do three basic things, you know, uh, stop bleeding uh, and, uh, you know, open up an airway and then at least recognize that there is some sort of uh, chest wound that may need evaluation. That's my personal opinion. Stacy, what do you think? I do think there's more we can do to sustain skills for our medics, for sure. And uh, um, I think, you know, the standardized TC3 curriculum that's coming out is a massive improvement over the existing training. And so if we were to, well, not if, when we fully implement that across the force, the four tiers of standardized TC3 training, uh, that will go a long way into improving the initial training of the force. Uh, this idea... I, I wish everyone could see me <laughs> nodding my head up and down right now going, yes, yes! This idea that two weeks of skill sustainment for medics every two years, I believe it is, is adequate, is preposterous. Um, I think that there are many opportunities to increase the clinical uh clinical exposures of our medics and you know I'd love to have them in the trauma base more uh, but there's also other skills in terms of you know just learning how to do conscious sedation there's a zillion conscious sedation procedures that go on airway management uh, in the OR uh, scrubbing in with the surgical teams whatever it is uh, there's more opportunities than are being used and I think you have to ask your question. Everybody says they don't have enough time to do this. You have to ask your ask the question like, well, what are you doing instead? Uh, uh, do you need to be seeing um, primary care clinic for your your guys, or can we hire a civilian to do that? Do you need to be, you know, doing some auxiliary uh, duties, uh, covering medic uh, standby on the range, or can we hire a civilian to do that so that our military medics can actually learn, you know, have free up some of their time to improve their clinical skills. And I think it would just take a pretty massive investment in hiring people to do some of the things our medics are doing that are low value added uh, in terms of their skill sustainment, which is, you know, a huge investment, honestly. Yeah, I mean, I think unfortunately, we have a lot of also we have uh, situations to where medics aren't allowed to perform the duties uh, they might in combat. And this has certainly been a, an issue uh, that's been addressed in multiple publications. Uh, but, you know, what, there are a lot of training injuries, a lot of training injuries. Are they combat injuries? No, but there's still injuries that require, you know, uh, appropriate assessment, and appropriate treatment and appropriate evacuation. Uh, and all those situations are just what we do in combat. It may not, you know, maybe I have a guy that's shot in the abdomen in combat that I need to do something different. But if I have a guy who, you know, on the range or, I don't know, maybe at a airborne operation, you know, broke his fever, 
you know, although I may be applying a traction splint and, or, you know, whatever splint you may use or this and that, he still, I need to assess him. Hey, did, did I give him analgesia? Do I need to give, is it open? Do I need to give antibiotics? And yada, yada, yada. It goes down the line. And a lot of these people, uh, people, a lot of these medics, uh, enlisted medical personnel are not given the ability or authorization by their brigade or battalion surgeons uh, to do this. Uh, you know, and a lot of it comes down to also the hospitals that uh, kind of, I should say, put up a fight, you know, say, hey, I need my medics to have these medications in order to provide the appropriate care in the pre-hospital environment. And so that I think that's also a significant issue that we we're going to fix address, that at DHA, uh, by the way. I, I I have no doubt that you are going to fix a lot of things <laughs> as you have over the years. <laughs> Well, we are actually working on a DHA policy for our MTFs to allow medics to practice their full scope of practice within the MTFs. Nice. That's amazing. I mean, I, we do it in soft all the time, right? So soft medics are, hey, here's your, here's everything that you would carry in combat. Now, Minus the drugs. There take care of any. Uh, what, are you, what are you talking about? <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. You do have Motrin. Um but, uh, what? yeah, I mean, everybody knows you need a surgical capable 18 Delta to, uh, man a flat range. So, Hey, Hey, I, if you can just carry some basic medications, that'd be fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, but, but seriously, I mean, that, that is an issue that, that I'm, I'm hoping that we can get addressed and I think would actually, uh, provide a lot of that same training, uh, not in such statement training, but allow them to sustain their skills and capabilities across the board instead of saying, hey, we go to a two week thing because we no longer have our, you know, our, our basic fundamentals down. Right. And I mean, essentially, that's the way it's got to be. You have to threaten them. Well, you're not threatening the medics, you're threatening the command that um, you will no longer be mission capable if your medics don't come here. Right. Um, yeah. essentially that's what it is. Um, but so with all this, you know, scope expansion and, um, you know, w building up the basics and things like that, I mean, you know, triage has come up so many times during this conversation, where does telemedicine and teleconsultation come into play when it comes to, I'm receiving a patient who is, far outside of my scope of practice. However, I'm the best chance they have. Where does this telemed, teleconsultation, when does that come into play? One thing about telemedicine, at least with our current uh, capabilities, is this, it's slow, right? It takes a while to gather the information and get a hold of the, the uh, consultant. And so um, now conceivably that could be sped up uh, te with technology. Um, however, in my mind, I I don't think, and we use telemedicine like 10 times a day in the hospital, right? We call someone smarter than us on, on certain things, you know, everything that you're not a specialist in, you just call the specialist all the time. Um, but rarely can you do that right in the middle of an immediate resuscitation, right? So you have to be able to, to uh, perform the initial stabilization of a critical patient without the assistance of telemedicine. So once you have, you know, gotten that amount of stabilization, you may be able to, um, especially if you have more than one, you know, medical person working on the patient, have someone get a hold of a telemedicine consult, um, but it, I think, does not have much of a role uh, in in a uh, really sort of dynamic pre-hospital environment. Um, potentially a role one clinic or you know a battalion aid station type of situation you could envision might be a scenario where you can get a hold of telemedicine. Um, it definitely has a role in expanding capabilities, no doubt. A uh, huge role in prolonged care. 
Um, but when we're talking about damage control surgery capabilities, um, it is going to have be the rare situation, I would guess, where you can really implement that into the decision making process that you need. And so uh, I think we really need to work on more technology to identify those patients who need damage control surgery rather than relying on being able to get a hold of a consultant at such a critical time. Right. I mean, just for me, I don't have the capability right now. I don't have the team right now. I don't have the equipment right now. Um, if I was presented with a patient that needed such a, an invasive type surgery, um, even though emotionally I may want to, um, the team is pushing me to, um, I would be pretty hard pressed. I think I would really love to call Andy and let Andy tell me that this is useless. Um, you're only going to make things worse. Um, you need to instead do X, Y, and Z, whether that could be palliative care, that could be, you need to put all your focus into uh, resuscitation and evacuation, whatever that advice is. Um, because even if it doesn't work out, I get to blame Andy. It was not my idea. Well, that's a good point, you yeah. know. And so it really comes down to, like, who's on the other end of the consult line. And that's not necessarily a consistent capability in and of itself. You know, you might call Andy right. and he might tell you do a Reboa. And then, you know, you might call some other surgeon and they may say, are you crazy? You know, just let, you know, just, just do palliative care. And, um, and so you know, ensuring that the consultants on the line have an understanding of the environment and uh, the decision making. I've actually thought many times that we might, that we would be better off with a three-way consultation so that you have a call between, you know, the guys at the point of injury, uh, their their battalion physician or PA, you know, like their, their doc for that unit that knows their capability and their environment very, very well. And then on the third line have the, uh, you know, the specialty consultant. And that way, uh, that three-way conversation, I think would, would uh, improve decision-making significantly. I think it would slow it down dramatically. Unfortunately, yes. Yeah, so currently with our current capabilities, for sure. Uh, I can only imagine two providers sword fighting each other over who gets to make the final decision. <laughs> what? I think the uh, I think if you look at some of these patients that hey, when is that important? One, it's probably after the first hour, right? So if I get someone past the first hour, as we've talked about, uh, and then you're in a second situation who may I have a patient who or a casualty that is, you know, as we may say, is like a responder to you know, like a blood transfusion, you know, Hey, I got, I got you know, he's a responder. Maybe, he's, maybe he's a, a partial responder that's really kind of hanging in there and you're kind of struggling about it. what is the next best kind of way to go with this, you know, with this casualty. Then, then I think, yeah, I think that's appropriate. Uh, and, and that's in the acute and more in the more of the acute phase versus, you know, where you look at these prolonged case, prolonged field care, prolonged casualty care, uh, to where you have a more of a sustained operation versus in the acute phase. That's, that's when I think about when it might be appropriate um, to be able to kind of reach out. And I do love the idea that, hey, can we have more than one kind of opinion or more of objective sort of, you know, uh, a viewpoint? Uh, you know, it, it, is that third person more of listening and just kind of kind of listening? Okay, okay, okay. okay. And then saying, yes, that is the case. Or is there maybe a second specialist on the line who can listen in objective more, try to be more objective about it. And then when the initial specialist says, I think this is X, what you should do, then the specialist says, that sounds reasonable based upon what I've heard. Well, it's a system, you know, you really need to train the consultants along with the medics, you know, as you're doing that together right. and mm -hmm. really work together on that because uh, just – calling people and asking them questions that are completely outside their experience is going to have uh, variable results. Right. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, 
a kind of a, a side to this. Does the, the consultants for the advisor line, do they get any other training other than they're a doctor? Not really, uh, at least for the surgical consultants. I have personally selected all of the surgeons on the list uh, as having a lot of operational experience. Um, I don't know about the other specialties. Uh, we have made an effort to bring the surgeons to the prolonged field care exercises in various locations to help them get that you know, sort of at least training knowledge of what is being trained and what equipment the teams have access to. Uh, so I think that that is really important to sustain. And then all of the exercise supports that the teams do. Uh, I don't think we get any feedback though from the, you know, whenever I get called on the advisor line, nobody ever gives me any feedback, whether that was like incredibly stupid advice or whether it was helpful. So I think, you know, looking yeah. at the consultants as part of the, you know, as also needing training, um, making sure that they're invited to the exercises to participate as, you know, subject matter experts and trainers, I think is really going to be, you know, part of the long-term solution as well. Yeah, no, absolutely. They don't teach um, you that in surgery school for sure. Not part right. of the curriculum. <laughs> yeah. Um, but that definitely should be some kind of read ahead at least like when this, you know, MOS calls you, this is what they mean. You know what I mean? Um, <laughs> I, I think I, I would, um, yeah, you, you're not taught much uh, about actually having to accept, uh, you know, a provide some feedback uh, over a phone or something like that. It'd be, I think that's one thing, that's a great point uh, that, you know, can we, have, can we improve uh, social education? What happens in a big peer to peer conflict if they have to actually? you know, use things like the draft. Are people going to be able to show up and be like, uh, take this call from this medic, uh, you know, wherever, and uh, provide them with some uh, rational, uh, you know, treatment plans? Right. So, I mean, that's, yeah. yeah I don't even want to start thinking about what could happen during a, a peer. <laughs> yeah. um, if I had to uh, currently leave to go to a combat zone, uh, you're probably better off having a combat medic make decisions on <laughs> surgery patients than a, than a, than a uh, soon to be or a rising PGY3. Right. Well, that's cause, that's just because you're absorbed into that <laughs> into that field. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. Um, once once you get to uh, once you get to see what's going on, you'll I'm sure you'll snap out of it. Um. All right. Last question. We've been going for quite a while. So, yeah, uh, I'll give you both a chance at it. Uh, Stacy, I'll let you go first. So what would you tell a medic or even a non-surgical provider who is facing a surgical emergency who has a 18 hour evacuation? Um, well, it would depend certainly what resources they have available, but uh, my um, first inclination would be to say, make sure they're breathing, make sure you've stopped all external hemorrhage, make sure you've decompressed the chest, and make sure you have really good IV access, get as much blood as you can, and uh, transfuse it as quickly as possible <laughs> until they uh, either uh, lose vital signs or until their vital signs stabilize. That would be my best advice. Hope fresh, warm, whole blood uh, can really temporize a lot of situations, and uh, it can actually really contribute to stopping the bleeding or at least replacing the blood that's going out. Well, reverse that lethal triad? Yes. Or the diamond, I'm sorry. Um, but... Uh... Andy, what do you think? I think it really depends on the the injury. Of course. Right. So if someone has like a uh, uh, retrohepatic IVC injury, but 
then you just probably need to prepare for, you know, that patient going to die. Mm-hmm. Is this, uh, you know, more of a junctional surgical injury where they may be able to control hemorrhage for the most part, uh, but then transfuse and get hemostasis? Or I, I shouldn't say hemostasis, but certainly uh, transfuse uh, to the point to where they can stabilize, then fantastic. Uh you know, so it, it it all depends. Is it just a you know gunshot uh, to the to the abdomen to where there's you know bowel perforation uh, and spillage uh, that is you know causing this to be a, a an emergency, or is this where they can give maybe antibiotics to temporize a little bit? Um, I'm I'm not sure. It'd be, it's it's very challenging to simply say a surgical emergency. What is the nature of the surgical emergency? And I you know I am simply a, a, you know, a junior surgery resident, uh, on this, uh, you know, podcast with, you know, one of the best trauma surgeons that we know. Uh, and so I would have to definitely defer to her what she would maybe recommend. So I feel awfully, I feel, um, right. (laughs) I probably feel like I've probably made a few, I could make a lot of errors in trying to try to make some recommendations based upon what I, have experienced at the point of injury versus what I know now versus what I don't know at all. Of course. I mean, literally nobody does know it all. Right. Um, but I, what, what I'd like to do is trying to give somebody some kind of general comfort in that I feel all the pressure in the world to jump forward and do something because nobody else is going to come help. Um, Again, I, I, okay, I'll say that if it comes down to the fact that you have someone who uh, responds to a transfusion, I have someone who I believe is bleeding, and they respond to the transfusion, and you can continue providing that, that blood transfusion in order to enable them to maintain some sort of blood pressure, fantastic. That's what you need to do. Uh if and you know, I think I agree with Stacey. Yes, but you know, the chest. Make sure there's no, you know, no tension. You know, ev- you know, evacuate any potential uh, hemothorax. Uh, maintain that. Make sure they maintain some sort of airway. And outside of that, if they don't respond after, you know, how many blood transfusions is it before you have to say, okay, this is futile? Uh, and I think that's a good question to ask and a good kind of perspective to put those put that person in that combat medic or PA or doc whoever is at that point of injury trying to provide and make these decisions ha, you know how many transfusions have they received and have they responded or do they keep you know do they keep falling off those pressures and it's time to potentially say this is not uh, a, a effort that we need to continue pursuing Perfect. That's a super challenging uh, call to make. I think you've made the point before about, you know, kind of supporting their decision to, uh, you know, decide that this is futile. And, uh, I, you know, that is a really, really difficult decision to make, even as a senior uh, trauma surgeon. I think I've always, always really appreciated having another surgeon available to support my even my decision you know this is a futile situation here uh you know we need to stop and so i think even just giving the medic that sort of emotional or mental support to to support their decision so it's not all on them to say you know this is futile especially you know in that environment is even more difficult and uh, so just to, to be able to support their decision at, at whatever point they've exhausted their resources and decide they, you know, that this is futile. But uh, yeah, I, I completely agree. I, I, and I think I, that's a, yeah, it's kind of what I was probably getting at without really saying it or, or acknowledging it. I, I think even in the trauma bay, you know, attending surgeon will look around the room and go, anyone else have yeah. any sort of, you know, any sort of input ideas or whatever that we can do here. And if there's not, then, then right. call you know, you know, it's, it is, so it is always challenging to, to do, say, but just having, you know, the moral support yeah. of uh, someone agreeing with you. Um, yeah, definitely yeah. helps. Yeah. 
Um, so yeah, I mean, so that's basically my basic advice is just continue transfusing blood until you run out of resources. I think that's the best, you know, best advice that we have right now. Uh, trying to jump in and do some, you know, uh, wazoo crazy surgery that you're not fully trained for is probably more likely to increase their bleeding and reduce their chances of survival than if you, you know, left their abdomen closed, take advantage of whatever amount of tamponade that there is in leaving the abdomen closed and just trying to get as much blood to that individual as you can. Um, I was recently on the receiving end of a civilian patient and really, really was, uh, you know, full on here in South, Southwest Texas patient arrived at a trauma center. Uh, but the surgeons there didn't, didn't really have the capability or the experience to do thoracotomies. The patient was injured in the chest and they basically did a perfect resuscitation, no crystalloids, whole blood, received whole blood here in Texas, uh, continued to resuscitate the patient, take care of their airway, all of the basics, and transferred them by helicopter to the level one trauma center where uh, she underwent a thoracotomy and a laparotomy about uh, 15 hours after her injury. And, uh, you know, with, with about 14 units of blood transfusion, two chest tubes, two rounds of CPR, and later on a thoracotomy and laparotomy, she ended up, you know, with a full recovery neurologically intact, uh, which was incredible and massively resource mm -hmm. intensive, but definitely made me realize that, you know, just transfusing blood and keeping the patient's, you know, attention to the basic resuscitation procedures really truly is your best temporizing measure. Perfect. I think that's a perfect way to end. Thank you again, Stacy and Andy for uh, joining me. You are most welcome. I would like to say, Hey, uh, Dennis, all, always, always a pleasure to do this. And I, um, I've just been super excited and that I've been able to do this with Stacy. She is one of my heroes and mentors and, uh, it's been super awesome to at least uh, go back and forth a little bit. Uh, surprisingly, or I guess just say not so surprisingly, I agree with most of what she says. <laughs> yep. All right, guys. Uh, thank you again. That's it for today's podcast. Be sure to go to our website, www.prolongfieldcare.org. Find us on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram. Subscribe and stay on the bleeding edge of combat medicine. This is Dennis for the PFC Podcast. Our boy is waiting there for you.